Good morning. Through this uh, series, we've been encouraged to hear from different folks to uh, share with us about their participation in a small group, what it's uh, meant to them. And this morning, Paul Bueller comes to share a little bit about a small group experience and what it's been like for him and how it's encouraged him and his family. So, uh, Linda and I met at a church on the north side of Indianapolis, and that church was building small groups when we, about the time we got married. And so we joined, we had a, a couple of friends that asked us to join their small groups. So we've known for a long time what the theory is about making the church smaller and meeting in small groups and, and uh, doing a Bible study and encouraging one another in our walk with the Lord. <clears throat> and we came down here about 23, 24 years ago. And the small, uh, small groups existed in this church, but there was a new sort of revival that came shortly after that and, uh, of small groups. And, and we, joined, we joined Cameron, Ken and Deborah Long's small group. And, and, and we've not looked back. We've been in a small group uh, ever since. And... Uh, with, with some minor changes in that, in that history of small groups. But, and we've learned a lot. Um, I even attended leadership training and even became involved in, in uh, small group leadership in this church for a while. And one thing I know is that each individual small group is unique, just as people are unique. And uh, people are encouraged in, in different ways, and, and people have different experiences of small groups. And we've gone through some bumps in the road along the ways, you know, lost a job, wrecked a car, you know, uh, minor things in life that people all experience. And the small group was always there to pray for us and encourage us, and we were always there for them as well whenever anybody had an issue they were dealing with, sometimes we would close the book and talk about and deal with it and pray for people in, in going through their storm they were having in their life. Linda and, and our daughter Brianna and I just recently came back from Florida where we took a week's vacation. And uh, I ran out to the grocery store to pick up dinner for that night. And while I was in there and, and approaching the checkout stand, the, the unmistakable smells and sound of a storm coming was inevitable. And as I approached the exit, there were 20 or so people that had amassed there, and it was absolutely pouring. This was a deluge. And the, the water was filling up puddles fast out in the parking lot, and a few brave souls risked getting drenched as they ran out to their cars. And I stayed back and right next to me was an umbrella stand and a couple of people walked up to the umbrella stand and started looking at the available umbrellas there and a guy comes over and says y you don't want to get an umbrella from there because those are cheap they're not going to work they're not going to hold up you know it may keep you dry to your car but i've got a trunk load of broken umbrellas that have not withsto withstood the winds you know what I'm talking about, those umbrellas, they're cheap, they're, they're not going to last. But yet, in that mix, there all, there's also some sturdier ones, but you have to pay a little bit more for those. And you take your chances at that stand right there. And that guy says, you don't want to invest in those, you want to invest before the storm comes and get you one that you're really comfortable enough. Don't go to, don't do don't buy one here at Walmart. Go somewhere else nicer, get a, get a really good one. And I couldn't help thinking, you know, it's like small groups. They're shelters for storms in your life. And maybe you'll have a strong storm. Maybe you will have a hurricane. And you will really need to rely on the people in your small groups. I know I have. Just over two, two years ago, you know, when I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, after I let my family know and my extended family know that, 
the next group of people I went to contact was my small groups and let them know. And they, I knew they would pray for me, and they did. And they came alongside me and encouraged me and were there for me. I want to thank the extended church. You've all supported us as well, provided meals for us, prayed for us. We have felt those prayers and very appreciative of, appreciative of them. But our small group been, has been our rock that we've leaned on during this time of the hurricane. And I know some of you have also experienced some hurricanes. There are some people right now in this church that are experiencing a hurricane in their life. And all we can do is say, you know, we love you, We're praying for you, come alongside of you and help you in any way we can. And so I pray that you never have a hurricane, but you're gonna have storms in life. So I just encourage you all, if you're not in a small group, to make an investment, look for that umbrella, the one that fits, that feels right in your hands, you hold it as you weather the storm. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, powerful information there for us. So, before we jump in, let me just remind you of something we're doing during this campaign. And I thought about making a canned announcement. Yeah. Um, remember, we're, we're trying to get a thousand of these, and we're, we're well on our way, but we need your help. And so, uh, if you're out shopping this week, or when you are out shopping this week, want to Pick up a few, a case, a couple of cases, however many you want to bring in, and help us get to 1,000 to help with the food pantries Thanksgiving uh, event there. Let's pray, shall we? And then uh, let's talk a little bit more. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we are here in your presence and that we are a part of something larger than ourselves. That we're part of your kingdom and a part of this part of the kingdom here at, at Eltsville Christian Church, that we're here together, and, and around us are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful for that. And as we look into your word this morning, Father, we, we ask that you would guide us to things each of us need to see. Some of us need some comfort this morning. Some of us need to be challenged. Some of us, Father, just need to be reminded to be courageous in what we're going through. And so, Lord, we pray that you would use this time to help us become who you want us to be. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me, real quick, just kind of cast a vision of, of where we're going a little bit for the rest of this fall. We're going to be, got a couple more weeks here in our sermon series. And then in Christmas, we're going to be looking and answering the question, what's so great about Christmas? And I want to encourage you to be on the watch on 46 over by the Monarchy. We're going to have a big billboard out for us, so keep an eye out for that. And take advantage of that, because what we'd really like you to do is invite your friends and family members to come and see what is so great about Christmas and to be a part of it. Christmas is a great time to invite a friend or two or three and uh, just remind them of what it means, that it's more than just about a manger and a baby, that there's a great story that is unfolding in that moment. So keep your eye out for that. Let's jump into our message this morning. 1 Corinthians 3, 8, and 9 says this, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Now, what's Paul talking about here? He's, he's addressing a church, the Corinthian church, that was a fairly divided church, very partisan in a lot of their, their thinking, their theology, and even kind of gathered around different celebrity uh, preachers and such. And so some people were saying, you know, hey, we're all in Apollos camp, and some of us were all with Paul, and some of us are all with Peter, and, and they've just kind of got this mindset. And so he addresses that in this way. He says, you know, there are different people who work in the process 
of growing up plants for a harvest. And some people plant and some people water, but they're all doing this together. And he goes on to say, he says, for we are co-workers in God's service. So he's talking about himself. He's talking about Paul, Peter, others. He says, we're co-workers. We're working together. We're not competing against one another. We're all on the same team. And so that reminds us, and we just have a quick reminder summary that we need each other. That if we're involved in the work in God's kingdom, we need each other. If we're trying to have a healthy family, whether it's the family of God in a church or the family at home in the house, we need each other. Romans 12.5 says this, So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And, and says no part of the body can function without being connected to the body. Nobody has, a, has an amputation and then says, now go be free. You know, go do whatever you want. Once, once it's disconnected from the body, that's it. It can't do anything. We have to remain connected to one another in order to be effective, in order to be healthy. And also, when we work together, we get more done. We've seen this before. Reminder, Ecclesiastes 4 and 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. The Bible often compares being together in ministry and serving together, making a difference in the world to, to gardening. And this is where he comes up with this phrase and this idea of planting and harvesting. But all of those different efforts have one goal, and that's the harvest moving in one direction. We have another word for when people work together, when they're a part of something, and we call it a team. Now, you might remember back, in, uh, and maybe you are on one now, or back in high school and college, and the times you're part of a, a team, maybe a baseball team, a basketball team, a football team, soccer, or maybe you're part of a choir. Maybe in the military, you were in a, a, a squad or some other unit. Maybe you're part of a cheerleading squad or a, a, a club or, or something else like that where people work together. And, and oftentimes, we have a lot of fond memories of those things because of we had to sacrifice, we had to work hard, and we, we had a goal that we wanted to accomplish. And so that helped us. And it somehow brought a bond that happens when people go through something challenging and yet overcome and achieve in that moment. It brings things together in a way in their hearts that no other work can. Now in a small group that many of you are in right now, one of the fastest ways to get your, your group to come together and to feel cohesive and to feel a part of something else is not just in the taking a few moments in, you know, the socializing aspect and the Bible study aspect, but it's in the service aspect. When you serve together, it has a way of binding you together even deeper. So we want to look at this idea of a team and just let it be a little acrostic for us to help us kind of remember what we need to do. And what we're going to talk about applies whether you're in a small group, uh, whether you're in a marriage or parenting, a child, whatever it is, when you've got these different kinds of relationships happening, these things will help you. They'll help you at work. So let's dig into these and see what we need. First thing we need to see is that trust. We need trust. It is that emotional glue that draws us closer to our friends, to family, even to our small groups. And without trust, teamwork is hard. It's impossible. You know, here we are in the, the middle of football season, and if you know anything about a football team, you know that one of the, the key players is the quarterback. And that quarterback's job is to get the ball down the field into the end zone. Now, he has a choice that he can make. He can either try to do it all himself, or he can pass the ball to someone else, and he can either do that by throwing it or handing it off. But whenever he does that, he has to trust his teammate to do the right thing. 
He has to trust, if he's going to pass, he has to trust that that receiver will be run the right route and be where he needs to be at just the right moment to catch the ball. And will we'll give his all to reach that ball and grab it and take it as far as he can. Or if he hands it off to a receiver, to know that that receiver is going to give all the speed he's got to it, he's going to dig in and go as far as he can with it. If he doesn't trust his teammates, he's going to try and do it himself. And if he does it himself all the time, play after play, play after play, the other team's going to figure it out and know what they've got to do to stop him. And that applies in all of our areas of life. We have to learn to trust other people in our lives. Oftentimes, we have a way that we like to do things, don't we? We have a way that we know this is the best way, this is the way that gets it done. And if I hand it off to someone else, it may not get done my way. And if it doesn't get done my way, maybe it won't get done the right way. But we have to give trust. We have to give it away. We have to let other people, whether it's a group, a team, a marriage, we have to learn to trust one another. Now, what can you hand off in a team? Well, you can hand off letting different people, or in a group, I'm sorry, you can let other people lead the discussion. You can let other people lead the prayer time. You can hand out the different responsibilities and let different people take a try at it and see how it goes. Now, if you want to be a trustworthy person, because this goes both ways. We can't just trust other people. We also have to be someone that others can trust. There are three quick things I want to show you if you want to be a trustworthy person. This will help you in your group, help you at church, help you in your family, help you at work. The first thing is to be consistent. You have to be consistent. Now, to think, what does that mean to to be consistent. Think of the opposite word. Think about when we use that word, oh, that person, you can't trust them because they're flighty. And you think about what a flighty person is. You know, they're here at this moment, then they're over here, then they're over here, then they're over here, and you can never pin them down. And you don't know when they'll show up. You don't know what they're going to do when they do show up, and they just always seem to be off somewhere else. But a consistent person shows up time after time after time. There are someone that you can depend on. And someone that you can trust. Luke 16.10 says this, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Now we oftentimes kind of fool ourselves in thinking, you know, give me the big job and I'll prove myself. But we pay no attention to the little things. But if you pay attention to the little things, time after time, you show yourself to be a trustworthy person. If you're an employer, you know what it means if you've got that employee that sometimes they show up on time, sometimes they show up late, sometimes they don't show up at all. Versus that person that's 10 minutes early to work every single day. You give them a project, they get it done. You give them a task, they, they don't just do it, they, they, they do even more for it. And you begin to see they're consistent. So what do you do? You give them some more to do. And oftentimes that comes with more compensation and such. So paying attention to the little things. If you're in a marriage, if you say you're going to do something, do it. A lot of us husbands, we've been down that road. We've heard it. You say, honey, when are you going to do this? Oh, I'm going to do it. You know, and you see, you notice your wife starting to do a project, and what do you first say? Hey, I was going to do that. Well, why didn't you? We have to learn to be consistent. We also have to learn to keep confidences. The Bible says a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man or woman keeps a secret. One of the things that gives small groups power is when people can be open and they can be honest. But if they're going to be open and honest, that's going to make them vulnerable. And if they do that, that means they've got to trust the people in the room that they're not going to take that information, they're not going to judge that information, and they're not going to share that information. So we have to learn how to keep a confidence. That if someone shares something with you confidentially, you lock it away. The only person you talk about with is God when you pray. Then another thing we have to do is to remain close. We're going to have to remain close. Proverbs 17.70 says, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born 
for a time of adversity. There's something that happens that when we go through something challenging, that we need someone close by. And we all have our seasons. We all have, as Paul said, there are those storms that come in. And sometimes we have the seasons of life that are just grand. The sun is shining. The air feels warm. And it's just good. And then there are other times when it feels dark and cold and windy. We feel alone. But if we have people who are close to us, it makes all the difference. We have to be close to people and consistency, consistently close so that people learn to trust us and to know that we are dependable and that we're a part of their lives. Another key to teamwork, we have trust and then we have empathy. And empathy is being able to connect with the person and let them know that you, you are with them whether it's a joyous time or a sorrowful time, you're there. You get it. You understand. One of the things, though, there are three things here that we, we look at. How can I get to that point where I'm showing empathy, where I'm being empathetic? Let me give you three quick clues. First off, slow down. Have you ever noticed that when you are moving fast at something, you miss the details? Maybe you're driving down the highway or down the road. Maybe you're at work. It's 4.30 on Friday and you want to get out and you've got these three things you've got to do. And you know if you do them real quick, you can get done by five and get out the door. And so you think you've got them all done. You come in on Monday morning and you look and you realize you missed a key element of something you were supposed to do. Why? Because you got in a hurry and you missed an important detail. We have to be able to kind of slow down. This is why families need to slow down and have meals together. Parents need to slow down and listen to your children. Sometimes we're just so busy doing, 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 we miss what's going on in people's lives. If you're in a small group time or with your family and say, hey, how was your day? And say, well, it was pretty rough. Well, okay, next, because we got we to gotta get done by 8.30. We'll pray for you. We just move along. We don't take any time. John, James 1.19 says this, be quick to listen and slow to speak. We have to learn how to slow it down so that we can be empathetic with folks. So not only do you need to slow down, but then you need to ask questions. So when you ask that person, hey, how's it going this week? How's your day going? It's rough. Well, what's been rough about it? Well, work. Well, tell me about work. What's going on? What's my boss? Tell me more. Just keep saying, tell me more. But you won't say, tell me more, if you're in a hurry. But if you ask questions and listen and ask questions in order to understand. So often we ask questions trying to simply figure out what we're going to say next. When really, what we just need to say, tell me a little more. Proverbs 25 says, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. Isn't that a great imagery of the heart, of the thought life of a person? These deep, deep thoughts that we have. We don't just bring up for anybody and everybody. It says this, but one who has insight draws them out. Now, there are those people in your life, and you know who they are. You ask them how they're, hey, how are you doing? They'll just tell you everything from the day they were born right up to that, that very minute. I mean, they just spew it out. I mean, let me tell you, and you're, part of you is like, oh, I didn't want that much information. And so to avoid that, so often we, we, we just kind of move along. But some people, they'll share but they have to know they can trust you. And you have to ask those questions until they get to that point where maybe they're not ready to share anymore. But if you share, ask, and you listen, you begin to learn some things that you need to know. When you become students of other people, and just say, tell me more. 
And learn to linger in that moment. And don't be afraid of silence. So often, as soon as it gets quiet, especially in a small group or in a marriage, somebody is thinking, they're talking, and somebody gets real quiet, well, we get nervous, let's, let's start talking. But something powerful often is happening in that moment of silence. Don't be afraid of it. Don't rush past it. Stay in that moment. And then finally, we want to relate to the emotions that people are feeling. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, if you really want to get good at this, if this is something you want to really develop in your life, simply go online, Google empathetic statements or empathetic words. Because what you're doing when you share somebody with somebody and you respond in an empathetic way, you're saying, I understand without using the words, I understand. So if somebody tells you something and it sounds to you like, wow, that's... It must have been very painful. You can say, wow, that sounds very painful. Now, what do you, was that person here in that moment? That you get what they're feeling, that you can relate to it, that you understand it and the experience. Empathy is more than saying, I'm sorry that you're hurt. It's saying, I hurt with you. And I, and I can understand why you hurt in this moment. You're willing to cry with people, to weep with them, or to laugh with them, if that's the case. So we learn to trust, we learn to be empathetic. We also need to learn to accommodate. Why do we do that? Well, because we're all different. And when you think about accommodation, what what are you doing? When you go and look for accommodations, what are you looking for? A room? Space? So when we accommodate other people on our team, in our lives, in our family, we're making space for them. We're letting them be who they are in our moment and in our lives. Romans 12, 18 says this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now notice here he says, as far as it depends on you. There, there's only so much you can do. You, you can only do what you can do, and you can't control what other people are going to do and how they're going to respond. They have their part, but you need to take care of your part. And there are a number of different ways that we can accommodate each other. One of those ways is to accommodate each other's needs. The needs that we all have in our lives. The Bible says this, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Now, the message paraphrase includes this thought, asking ourselves, how can I help? So one way that we accommodate people's needs is we we simply respond to them, how can I help? And we can do that, can we? Let's remember, let's say that together. So when someone is telling you they're having a rough day, if you come home and your spouse is tense and something's up and you can just sense they have so much going on, don't say, you know what you need to do. (laughs) You say, how can I help? They may say, well, can you take the kids here? Can you go and load the dishwasher? Can you do this thing over here? How can I help? If you hear your neighbor has going through a hard time, how can I help? If you're sharing in your small group and you hear something, say, how can I help? How can we help? What do you need? Let us be there for you. Another way that we accommodate other people is to accommodate each other's ideas. We often see this in marriage early on. Two people get married, and they have an idea of how life is supposed to work, how families are supposed to be. And so you've got person A over here, and and, and they've got their ideas. Then you've got person B over here, and they've got their ideas. And then they come together in harmony, right? (laughs) If you've been married, you know, it's usually that's where the sparks start, explosion. As each person tries to convince and argue and cajole the other person to agree that their idea is the right idea. 
But that doesn't create unity. That doesn't make a team. We have to learn to accommodate each other's ideas. Whether you're at work, in a group, in a family, listen. Make space for other ideas. Now, I understand not every idea is a good idea. If your spouse comes home and says, honey, the preacher said, you've got to accommodate my ideas, and my idea is to take all of our savings and go to Vegas and see if we can make it bigger, you might not want to accommodate that one. We have to use some discernment here. But what you can do is say, okay, well, that's an idea, but how about, and have the dialogue and the conversation that it takes to take two ideas and come up with a better idea. Proverbs 18.15 says this, Wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. We have a tendency oftentimes to think that once we know something, we don't need any new ideas. I've got it figured out. And that makes me smart. If I already know everything, I'm smart, right? Actually, smart people are always looking for new information, new insights. New understandings. It's not how much they know, but how much they can, how much more they can know. So we learn to accommodate each other's ideas. We also need to accommodate each other's personalities. Why is that? Because we're all weird. Aren't we? You know, when we think about personalities, We think of extroverts and introverts, but there are all sorts of spectrums and all sorts of detailed things when people who map out personalities, and we've all got different personalities. And we have to make room for them. And if you look around your group, and if you look around your family, and you look around your team or your workplace, you're going to see all those different personalities. And one of the first things that we often try to do, and the biggest mistake we make, is to try to change people's personalities. There's an old saying about marriage that, that women marry men hoping to change them, and that men marry women hoping they'll never change, and they're both wrong. And they're both disappointed. We have to make room for the different personalities that are represented in our groups, families, workplaces, teams, and allow people and learn from it. And it's easy to get agitated and annoyed by other people's personality quirks and how they do things. Or we can remind ourselves there's a reason why they're approaching this information the way they do. That's just how they're wired up. What can I learn from it? And we also then, we need to accommodate each other's faults. If you're perfect, will you stand up? <laughs> I've got I to sit down myself just to <laughs> be an equal opportunity person here. Yeah. We don't, we all have faults. None of us is perfect. And if you're always looking for a perfect church, you'll always be disappointed. If you're always looking for the perfect workplace, you'll always be disappointed. If you're always looking for a perfect team, you'll always be disappointed. And if you're looking for a perfect family, you'll really be disappointed. We all have faults. And when, what do we do with faults? We give grace. And the way to make a cohesive group is to give grace to one another's faults. Ephesians 4.2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, why would we need to bear with one another in love? Because we all have faults, shortcomings. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says, and that means that's going to happen in our lives with the people that we know and love. But we can choose to accommodate, to give them room. Now, here's the final element. So we need to trust, we need to be empathetic, we need to accommodate, but we also need something very important that makes a team a team. And that's a mission. We need a mission. Here we are in the middle of the the World Series, and I'm actually paying attention because the Dodgers are, are playing this year. Yeah, all right, there we go. 
And think about this way back in March, when teams, these teams started getting together, what were they thinking? And they said, why are we here together? Well, I'm here to hit the ball and catch the ball. Well, good. <laughs> but why are we a team? Why do we exist? What are we here to do? And if they didn't have this in mind, they weren't going to hit it. And that is they exist to win the top championship in their sport. If you talk to top athletes, I mean, people at the professional level, and if they didn't win the gold medal or the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever it is was the top of their sport, if they didn't win that, they're disappointed in their career because that's what they got in it for, to achieve that goal. So what's our mission? Well, look what he says here. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then when I come, this is Paul speaking, when I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And that's what we're talking about here, that as a team, we strive together. When a baseball team tries to win their championship, they're striving together. When a military unit is striving together, they're trying to win a battle. If you're in a business, you're striving together to, to get a product built, developed, sold. But you strive together, you work together to make that happen. You sacrifice for one another. You trust one another. You push one another. You give your all for one another. But what we have unique here as the church is we are striving as one for the faith of the gospel. Now we here at the church, at Ellisville Christian Church, we don't exist simply to have a place to get in out of the cold. You could stay home and do that. We don't exist just so we can come and sing to God, songs together. You could go to a concert. You could turn on the radio to do that. We exist to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Anything short, there's no reason for us to be existing. And your groups that you're in, or maybe contemplating being in, they exist to make disciples. It is a context for discipleship making, for learning about Jesus, understanding Jesus, serving in the name of Jesus, praying in the name of Jesus, all those things we give an opportunity for within a small group. Your family can exist for such a purpose. But if you take that purpose out, you lose your reason to exist and you just devolve into a gathering. And gatherings are okay. But after a while, a gathering that has no specific purpose, you abandon. And maybe you know that. Maybe you've, you've been a part of some event and you just, you've sensed they just lost their reason for gathering. So I just don't even go anymore because all we're doing is sitting around looking at each other. But we in the church, we strive together for the faith of the gospel. I'm going to sing a song here in just a moment. The chorus goes like this. I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be your voice every time I speak. I want to run to the ones in need in the name of Jesus. I want to give my life away all for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. That's a mission right there. And as we sing this song, I want to encourage you to contemplate, is that the mission of your life? And if you're in a group, is that the mission of your group? And as a church, how that is the mission of our church? To go where we need to go, to do what we need to do, to say what we need to say for the sake of the kingdom. Because here's what's at stake. Without the kingdom, people spend eternity away from God. And that's not a good place. It's not a good thing. We invite people into the kingdom 
so they can know their Savior. And they can spend eternity with God. Eternity for people hangs in the balance of us accomplishing our mission. Will you pray about giving yourself over to that mission? And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior and would like to do that, if you'd like to be a Christ follower, to call on the name of Jesus, to be immersed in the waters of baptism, we invite you to come forward at this time. Or if you just need to talk to someone, grab one of us and say, talk to me about this Jesus. Grab out your smartphone this morning, send us an email and say, I need to talk to someone about this Jesus, about this Christianity thing. I need to know more. I want to know more. But don't let this morning get away from you without committing yourself to something more. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have here in the name of Jesus. And I'm thankful for each of the people in this room this morning. My brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are coming and and beginning to wonder and look and and think about this Christ-following business. Lord, I pray that you will speak now to each of us with your spirit something we need to understand, to take something away from this message, to make a decision that we need to make. Help us to be team members for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.